Well, good morning, everybody. This is Memorial Day weekend. I want to welcome those of you joining us online and my own family out at a campground right now. Others of you joining out there, uh, welcome to you wherever you may be this weekend. We're in a series uh, about generational blessing and curse. And we've been talking about what the Bible calls the sin of the parents. The Bible is very clear that sin does not happen in isolation, but there is a ripple effect. Sin affects other people. It affects generations of people. In its most extreme forms, this can be applied to mass shootings. Sin affects generations. Sin may be caused by generational curse. But in its most common forms, this is applied to addictions and shame and family dysfunction and abuse. Here's how the Bible puts it in Exodus 34, 7. The sins of the parents are laid upon their children and grandchildren. The entire family is affected, even children to the third and fourth generations. There are hundreds of families, thousands of families that we could use as a case study uh, today, your family or mine, but the example we've been following is a famous family from the Bible, and if you've been tracking along with us these last four weeks, you know this family has lots of dysfunction, they have lots of problems, this family needs lots of help, they need Dr. Phil, Dr. Laura, Dr. Ruth, Dr. Pepper, they need somebody. Uh, and. and uh, I've often wondered why the Bible writers included these sordid details of these families who are otherwise heroes of the Bible. And maybe they include these details so that you and I can feel better about our own families. You, you think my family's dysfunctional? You should see the families of the Bible. Uh, maybe the details are included to give us some hope because there is no family problem that shuts God out. If God can work in and through these families of the Bible that maybe God can work in mine. Or maybe uh, God guided the writers of the Bible by His Spirit in such a way so that the message would be clear that really there is only one really uh, true hero of the Bible, and that is God Himself. God works in and through normal, fallible, mistake-making, sin-prone people. Isn't that good news? That's really good news to you and to me. We continue our study today of this famous family by going one generation deeper. We're going to follow this family now to the third and fourth generation. We started looking at Isaac and Rebecca, mom and dad. We jumped into the generational chain right here, and we saw they had two sons, Jacob and Esau, and they played favorites. Isaac loved Esau, Rebecca loved Jacob, and their favoritism tore this family apart, and the two sons will be estranged for 20 years. Then we knocked it down a level and we looked at Jacob and his sons. He had 12 sons and his sons uh, uh, hate their brother, their favorite of their son, Joseph. And we see how the, the brothers sold Joseph into slavery and the lifelong struggle that he had. And today we go down another level and look at the sons of Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh. Ephraim and Manasseh are lesser known in their family than the previous generations of their famous family. In fact, they're lesser known uh, characters in the Bible. Uh, they're not really in any of the major stories of the Old Testament narrative. They're not even given any lines to say. They never speak. Uh, we, we read nothing about notable accomplishments of these two, and you likely did not learn about them as a child in Sunday school. And yet for 3,700 years, Jewish dads have been pronouncing blessing upon their children, and the blessing begins this way, may God make you like Ephraim and Manasseh. Ephraim and Manasseh, not common names to us, but they are very well known within Judaism, and for thousands of years to this day, this is the blessing that has passed through generations, may God make you like Ephraim and Manasseh. Seems like an odd choice to us. They're more notable heroes of the Bible, uh, why not may God make you like Moses and Joshua, or like Elijah and Elisha, or like David and Solomon? But the Ephraim Manasseh blessing is the one that's mandated in the scriptures. When Joseph rushed his boys to their dying grandfather's side in today's story to get a blessing, Jacob, who was called Israel, not only blessed his two grandsons, 
but mandated that future generations would bless their kids in the same way. This is what you heard read earlier today by Millie, uh, Genesis 48, 20. So Israel blessed them that day and said, when blessing is given in Israel, they will say, may God make you like Ephraim and Manasseh. And generations of Jewish families have followed suit. For thousands of years, this has been done. This is arguably the most important blessing in the whole Bible, and yet there is no consensus in Jewish scholarship as to why, as to what lies behind this profound blessing. And since there's no consensus, I'm going to take a stab at it today. I'll launch some ideas. Maybe the power of this blessing lies in the names of the boys. Joseph gave to his sons names that had meaning. We looked at this briefly last Sunday. We read Genesis 41. Joseph named his firstborn Manasseh and said, It is because God has made me forget all my troubles and all my father's household. The second son he named Ephraim and said, It is because God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. The name Manasseh sounds like the Hebrew word for forget. Now, Joseph didn't literally forget the home of his childhood. He didn't forget his past problems, but God made it possible for him to move past them. And so maybe when we bless someone to be like Manasseh, maybe what we're saying is your past troubles don't need to define you. A new day has dawned and you can walk into the future in freedom. The second child, Ephraim, the root uh, word there comes from an, uh, the word meaning fruitful, and that little ayam at the end is a word that means double or twice. So Ephraim literally means twice fruitful, doubly fruitful. That's what uh, this means. Now, certainly uh, part of the name means the blessing of having two sons, but I think Joseph thought broader than that, that God has made me, Joseph thought, twice as fruitful as I could have ever possibly imagined. So maybe when we bless someone to be like Ephraim, what we're saying is, may you be twice as fruitful as you could ever be in your own power. We bless someone to be like Ephraim and Manasseh, maybe what we're saying in this blessing is to say, may God help you to walk in freedom from the shame and burden of the past, and walk into the future with confidence and abundance. Maybe the secret sauce in this blessing lies in the names of those two boys, and maybe that's why this is the blessing that was mandated for generations. That's a good blessing, right? Or maybe it has to do more with Jacob than with his grandchildren. Uh, this is more than a grandchild blessing. This is a family turning point. It seems to be the moment, the first moment in Jacob's long struggle-filled life that he grasps grace. Jacob struggled his whole life with feelings of shame and inferiority. He felt unblessed by his family, unblessed by God, and it all stops here. When Jacob first laid eyes on his grandsons, this is what he says to Joseph in verse 11, I never expected to see your face again, son. Joseph, I thought you were dead, and now God has allowed me to see your children too. Suddenly, grace breaks through. And you can tell the way Jacob refers to God a few lines later that he's thinking very differently. He said in verse 15, he refers to God as the God who has what? Been my shepherd all my life to this day. Jacob is only recognizing that right now. He's looking back over his long life. It finally dawned on him God had been there the whole time, that he wasn't biased against. He wasn't cursed for being second born. He was blessed. He wasn't unfavored by God. He was favored. And Jacob is thrilled by this, and he's thrilled to be able to bless his grandsons. So Joseph brings the grandsons in, puts the older boy on the grandfather's right side the younger boy on the father's left side. And the old man gets ready to place his hands on the boys and to bless them. And then he does the unthinkable. He switches hands. The hand of favor reserved for the firstborn is now laid on the secondborn and his left hand on the older uh, child. Joseph tries to correct him. Hey, Dad, wait a minute. Uh, Dad, you're, you're doing this wrong. And, and Jacob says, don't tell me how to grandparent. Uh, 
He says, I know, I know, son. I know the customs. I know that I'm supposed to put the right hand on the older boy. I know all that. I know all that. But trust me, I know what I'm doing. For the first time in my life, I am clear. Blessing and favor will not be dictated by culture and tradition, but by grace. Let my final act, let me cross my arms, son. Let the final act of my life be an act of grace. Jacob recognized in this moment the blessing that God wants every one of his children to have. May your life be shaped not by culture or by strife-filled effort, but by the sheer grace of our good God. That's a good blessing, right? Now, those of us who weren't first born in our families, we love this story. Those of you who were first born, you don't like this story as much. It seems unfair. Why did the older boy get gypped? He was supposed to get the, the right hand. And if there's only one right hand, doesn't somebody get gypped all the time? And if you're bothered by the unfairness of this, if it bothers you that, that Jacob crossed his hands and the wrong kid got blessed, stay tuned because you are about to see the unfair, beautiful component of this blessing. Jacob's blessing of Ephraim and Manasseh was a shadow, was a prefiguring of the day that God would cross his arms in the heavenlies. Fifth century church father, uh, St. Augustine, wrote, in the Old Testament, the new is concealed. In the new, the old is revealed. He was saying what the Apostle Paul was saying and describing a lot of the Old Testament festivals and practices. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Colossus, uh, wrote to the Colossian church and said, these are a shadow of the things that are to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Right? God made it his mysterious habit to orchestrate real life events in the Old Testament that would point to Jesus. They were a shadow of things that were to come. Sometimes you see a person's shadow before you see the person. In the fullness of time, God sent his son into the broken world. Paul says again to the church of, Coloss of Colossians, the son is the image of the invisible God, the what? The firstborn over all creation. Jesus is the firstborn son at the right hand of God. You and I are secondborn sons. Jesus is firstborn. We are secondborn. And who deserves the greater blessing, you or Jesus? Yeah, that was not a trick question. <laughs> Jesus, and yet when the firstborn son, son hung on the cross, God did the unthinkable, and he crossed his arms. And the hand of God's blessing was placed on the second board, was placed on you and on me. And Paul, a lot of his letters are trying to explain this miraculous truth. He says in Galatians, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. Jesus bore the curse so we could bear the blessing. The Father's right hand of blessing came to rest on you and me and everyone who puts their trust in Christ. The curse fell on Jesus. Paul said in uh, 2 Corinthians, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus took our every sin and gave to us his own blessing. It was a switch a -roo. Christ exchanged places with us, and because he stood in our place, we can stand in his. It means the Father loves us in the same manner and to the same degree as the Father loves his only begotten Son. This is just incredible. Paul says again, God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. The Father crossed his arms and maybe the angels try to stop him and pull it apart, but he is God Almighty and he knows what he is doing. You have already been made as Ephraim and Manasseh. You have already received the right hand of blessing and favor of God. In the time that remains, I'd like us to look at how we can bless our kids, our grandkids, our spouse, our neighbor using the model of the Hebrew blessing. And we're going to get very, very practical here. 
Dr. Gary Smalley and John Trent in their classic book, The Blessing. That book's worth dusting off every now and again, an older book. But they outline four ingredients of every real blessing and four ingredients of all the biblical blessings. The authors write this, a, a family blessing begins with meaningful touch. That's ingredient number one. It continues with a spoken message of high value. That's, a message, that's ingredient two. A message that pictures a special future for the individual being blessed, three. And one that is based on an active commitment to see the blessing come to pass. These ingredients of a biblical blessing can be used to bless a child, a grandchild. Again, they can be used to bless a spouse, a neighbor, a friend. We'll look at each ingredient uh, in turn, just kind of rapid fire this morning. First ingredient, meaningful touch. Meaningful touch was an essential ingredient in the blessing of, in Old Testament homes. Uh, we read this morning, uh, verse 10, Now Israel's eyes were failing because of old age, and he could hardly see. So Joseph brought his sons close to him, and his father kissed them and embraced them. And a few verses later, we read, But Israel reached out his right hand and put it on Ephraim's head, and his left hand on Manasseh's head. And this is not an isolated incident in Scripture. All the Hebrew blessings involve some kind of touch. The laying on of hands, a kiss, an embrace, a hug. Now, when children are small, we don't bless them with words. They don't know words. And so instead, Instinctively, we show our love by cuddling them, by holding them. But Jacob was 40 years old when his father kissed him and blessed him. Everybody needs this of all ages. My father, like a lot of men of his generation, did not hug his sons after age eight or nine. He was not into physical touch. Maybe, like other people of his generation, he, was, he didn't want his sons to become wimpy or soft. Maybe it has to do with our ethnic heritage. I have friends from South America. Their family members are always hugging and kissing each other. And even the adult sons, when they greet their father, they kiss him on the cheek. My family is Scottish, and we just nod at each other from across the room. <laughs> when my father was 90 years old, I started to hug him, and he hated it. He bristled. But I thought, he's 90, what's he going to do? <laughs> and after a while, it became more normal. He, he didn't resist. Uh, I don't think he minded as much. And one of the last times I saw him, I hugged him to leave. And I, I just turned and I kissed his cheek. I had not done that before. I don't know why I did it then. I don't know if I felt like he needed it or I felt like I needed it. I was 50 years old. I don't know if I blessed him or he blessed me or whether it was a combination of both. Meaningful touch has to be handled carefully, of course. It's got to be appropriate. It's got to be welcomed. It's got to be wanted. But that's the first ingredient of a blessing. Ingredient number two, a spoken message. Blessings are always spoken. They are verbal. Abraham spoke his blessing to his son Isaac. Isaac spoke a blessing to his son Jacob. Jacob gave a verbal blessing to all 12 of his sons, and as we have seen, a special verbal blessing to his two grandsons. And when God blessed his world, the world he made with the gift of his son, it was his word that became flesh and made his dwelling among us. God is the God of the spoken word. Now, some people think, well, you know, I've never, I've never yelled at my kids. I've never uh, uh, said bad things to my kids. That's great. But the absence of negative words does not, does not constitute the blessing. The blessing must be spoken in a positive manner. Now, listen, uh, parents, your kids, your grandkids are going to get beat down by the world soon enough. You don't have to worry about pumping up and making them arrogant. Our job as parents, grandparents, and friends, and spouses is to heap affirmation on the ones we want to bless. You are amazing. You're so good at that. I'm so glad you're my daughter. I'm so glad you're my spouse. Uh, you've got incredible gifts. You are so valuable to me, and you're so valuable to God. We communicate verbally a message of high value. And then ingredient number three, picturing a special future for the one being blessed. 
A blessing helps the one being blessed raise their sights and see what they could be someday in the future. Uh, In the case of the one we're looking at today, Jacob blesses grandchildren. He said, may they be called by my name and the names of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and may they increase greatly on the earth. Increase was a very common blessing, increase in size, increase in influence, uh, increase uh, uh, in your life. We help our kids see themselves increased, and we help them discover their gifts to do that. And then lastly, ingredient number four, an active commitment to fulfill the blessing. The last ingredient is, goes with the responsibility of helping the one who's being blessed succeed. Why is an active commitment so important? Words alone cannot communicate the blessing. They need to be backed up with a commitment to do everything that we can to help the person flourish. When the old Jacob saw his grandsons, the patriarch did something kind of radical. He adopted them. He adopted his grandchildren. That's what Millie read in verse 5. Now then, your two sons, born to you in Egypt before I came to you, will be reckoned as mine. Ephraim and Manasseh will be mine, just as Reuben and Simeon are mine. Reuben and Simeon were his firstborn sons. So Jacob welcomes Ephraim and Manasseh at the highest level, in first position. They will have a share of the inheritance. They will have a portion of the land. They are backed up for success. Now Jacob himself, he's about to die and he knows it. He can't promise too much commitment himself during his earthly life, so he invokes God's help. He remembers that God has moved in his life very practical ways, and God will move in your life as well. We bless our kids when we say, I am with you, and God is with you. I will help you, and God will help you. You are not alone. Let's bless our children and our grandchildren and our spouses and our friends and our neighbors you might not be able to get all four elements in in one shot in a formal blessing way, but you can leak it, a meaningful touch, a kind word, a commitment for good. And when you give blessing, you get it in return. If you, like Jacob, miss the blessing as a child and you've got this hole in your heart that you've been trying to fill your whole life long, When you bless somebody else, you find that hole starts to get filled. It starts to fill up the empty places in yourself. Henry Nouwen was a gifted writer on spiritual things, an academic scholar, but in later years, he became the head of a little community in Toronto for adults with developmental disabilities. And shortly before he started a prayer service in one of the houses, Janet, a member of that house, said, Henry, can you give me a blessing? And Henry wasn't sure what she meant by that. So as a Catholic priest, he just instinctively made the sign of the cross on her forehead with his thumb. And Janet said, no, Henry, I want a real blessing. And Henry said, oh, I'm sorry, Janet. I'll give you a blessing at tonight's meeting. And Henry had no idea what he was going to do, but at least he bought some time to think about it. And when the evening meeting came, 30 people gathered in a circle Uh, Henry still wasn't sure what to do, but he said to the group, Janet has asked for a special blessing, and she feels like she needs it at this time. He still wasn't sure what he was going to do, but Janet came out of the circle, went right up to him, wrapped her arms around Henry, and placed her head on his chest. He's wearing the Catholic robes with ample sleeves, and he wrapped his arms around her. Uh, He said in 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 his book, it seemed like she disappeared in the robes. As they held each other, he thought to say, Janet, I want you to know that you are God's beloved daughter. You are precious in God's eyes. Your beautiful smile, your kindness to the people in your house, and all the good things you do show us what a beautiful human being you are. I know you're feeling a little low these days and that there is some sadness in your heart, but I want you to remember who you are a very special person, deeply loved by God and by all the people who are here with you. As he finished, Janet raised her head out of his chest and looked up at him and smiled. And he knew that she had received the blessing she had been asking for. 
She went back to take her seat, and another member of the community named Jane raised her hand and said, I want a blessing too. And she stood up and ran, wrapped her arms around Henry, put her head on his chest, and Henry wrapped another soul in his arms and prayed a similar blessing for her. And then one by one, every member of the community came forward, wanted to be blessed and to be blessed in the same way. Now, when reflected that one of the most touching moments was when one of his uh, student assistants on his staff, a 24-year-old student who was there to help the other residents, he raised his hand and he came to Henry and wrapped his arms around him and put his head on his chest. He asked for a blessing too. And I think if you and I had been there, maybe we would raise our hands as well. So start receiving blessing by giving blessing. And when you bless others, it breaks whatever generational curse you received if you lack the blessing in your own household. We can get blessing by giving blessing. Let's pray together. Oh God, great is your faithfulness. You have been good to us even in those seasons when we did not recognize it. You have been faithful even when we were faithless. You bore the curse so we could bear the blessing. You, you take what is and make it beautiful. You restore all things. You restore us. You alone hold the power to redeem. Help us to receive the blessing you have for each one of us that we might live as blessed people who bless others. This we pray in the life-giving name of our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. And everybody agreed and said, Amen. Amen.